Good evening. Wow, that's loud. My name is Jeff Groves, and as the Dean of the Faculty at Harvey Mudd College, I want to welcome you to the Spring 2015 Michael Moody Mathematics Lecture. Michael Moody was an excellent faculty member and an excellent college citizen at Harvey Mudd College, and he was especially a cherished friend, a mentor, and an inspiration to the Department of Mathematics, a real force of nature, Mike was. Mike came to the college in 1994, and in 1996, he became Harvey Mudd College's first Diana and Kenneth Johnson professor, and he was named Chair of the Department of Mathematics. During his time as department chair from 1996 through 2002, the department hired eight new professors, bringing the total number of mathematics faculty to 12. Mike wanted to hire people who would mesmerize and inspire students in the classroom and who had a passion for their mathematical work. He gave the department what he called an animating goal, to be recognized as one of the very best undergraduate programs in the country. The department credits Mike as the guiding force leading to the receipt in 2006 of the inaugural American Mathematical Society Award for, ex for an exemplary program or achievement in a mathematics department. HMC was singled out for this honor among all of the undergraduate and graduate mathematics departments in the United States. At the time of his death in January 2010, Mike was Vice President for Academic Affairs and Founding Dean of Faculty at Olin College in Massachusetts. That spring, the HMC Alumni Association named Mike Moody an honorary alumnus in recognition of his many contributions to the college. The Moody Lecture Series was established by the Mathematics Department to honor Mike's legacy at Harvey Mudd College. It is supported by gifts from his family, friends, colleagues, and former students. I'd like to thank the entire mathematics department on this occasion, but especially Lisette DePillis, John Jacobson, and Andrew Burnoff for arranging this lecture. And now I'd like to pass the microphone on to Art Benjamin, who's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Art. Thanks, Jeff. Well, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Tim Chartier tonight. Uh, Tim grew up in Philadelphia, but he spent a couple years of his preschool years living out here in West Covina. He, uh, he did his undergraduate at Western Michigan University, went, got his Ph.D. in mathematics from the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, did a postdoc at University of Washington. For the last 12 years, he's been a professor of mathematics at Davidson College. Uh, his area of expertise is applied mathematics, including linear algebra, partial differential equations, and uh, data analytics. Uh, he's the winner of the prestigious Alder Prize given to an outstanding professor, young professor of mathematics from the Mathematical Association of America. He's been an associate editor of Math Horizons. I've had the pleasure of working with him on that. He, is a, uh, he was the MAA's inaugural winner, uh, inaugural, inaugural selection as a math ambassador. 2014. And to give you the kind of idea of the kind of force of nature Tim is, in the last year alone, he's had two books come out, including this one, When Life is Linear, another book called um, Math Bites by Princeton University Press. That's Bites spelled B-Y-T-E-S. Uh, he has uh, uh, a DVD course on data analytics and data mining, and he's putting together a MOOC, all of this in the last year. He is, uh, he's appeared on ESPN, National Public Radio, CBS Evening News, USA Today, New York Times. Most of all, I'm proud to call him my friend. And by the end of today's lecture, you'll have no doubt who's number one. Let's introduce Tim Chartier, who'll talk about who's number one from ranking to bracketology. Tim. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, it's an honor to speak in the Moody Lecture Series, given uh, the force of nature that your school and your department and your faculty are. They, you and the department and the faculty here continue to inspire those of us around the country that also work to engage people in math, engage students in math, and engage the public in math as well. So tonight we're going to talk about who's number one. If you have not figured out that it's March, you will very soon figure out that it is March. 
And if you are not mad about March, you will get mad about March because you will get tired of hearing about the madness of March. A year ago, this might have made you a billion dollars. Now, that's actually not true because if I was totally honest with you a year ago, I would have said it will make your odds better to win a billion dollars, but you still will not win. Will you get a perfect bracket? It is possible, but it is not probable. And so that was one of the things we'll talk about today. But I want to show you that tonight, that if you are not a sports fan, you can now take part in bracketology and possibly do really well. Now, there's a thing in there I just said that you are Harvey Mudd, and I very carefully chose my words there, possibly, because the bracket will be your own. It will be your own bracket where you make math decisions yourself to determine the bracket that you will do. A year ago when I was being interviewed by Bloomberg Businessweek, the reporter was interviewing me. It's always interested, interesting to be interviewed by media because I am a math professor. And they'll say, this is only going to take 15 minutes. Okay. And then 45 minutes later, they're like, this is great. And it's like, man, this is going to take 15 minutes because in about two minutes I'm going to figure out that this really shouldn't take 15 minutes. It's pretty much what they're thinking. But in that particular interview, all of a sudden he went, you know what? I just figured this out. You're not trying to be Nate Silver. I said, no, I'm really not. And he said, but you're never going to tell me your picks. And I said, no, I'm not. You are trying to get us to do the math. And I said, that's exactly right. So tonight, my goal is to teach you how to do your own bracketology, regardless of your interest in March Madness. So the goal is to figure out who is number one. That's what we wonder, right? I mean, I don't know. Sports may not be. I've been told that the, your athletic teams are not quite like Davidson, where last night we performed my, uh, mine, and in the middle of the show, my wife Tanya had a long extended sketch, so I went on Twitter and checked the game because we take basketball very seriously at Davidson College, and we were ahead, so I didn't check again until the end of the show because I do need to concentrate on the show. And, but really, even though teams want to say, I am number one, that is not what we're trying to figure out tonight. We're trying to figure more of that out. We're trying to figure out who is number two, who's number three, number five, number eight, number 13. And the question can be, why? Why do I need to know all that? What is that about? Well, the reason why is because we're going to do bracketology. And we're going to, moreover, actually do ranking, which is my actual overall field. You do ranking when you input something to Google. It looks at eigenvectors. It's an eigenvector that helps determine that actual rank that you have. And then we can use ranking tonight, which we'll get into. But as you see on the slide, there are two purposes to ranking, which are very important. Because at the end of the talk, you'll have time to ask questions. And I was asked, do you want no questions, a few questions, or a lot of questions? I will be here until you are done with questions because I love sharing this field. And I am on East Coast time, so that is a commitment. I love to share it. But within anything you ask, this is what you must think. If you were my researcher, which in a sense we are right now, because who knows what you'll ask, at this moment you have to think two things. The goal of your, of your ranking can be many things, but here are the two that are most common. One is that you're just trying to rank the teams over the whole season. I'm trying to give them an API ranking or whatever it is in terms of what you're doing. That's one. The other is to predict, to predict the game tomorrow night, to predict the game next week, to predict the entire bracket. Sometimes those are the same, but they often are not at all. So generally, if you watch really carefully, even when I'm talking to you, you'll hear me flip between those. And given the time for me and the day, you might even hear me have to correct myself, and it's usually about that point right there. Because if you confuse that, you can have the right method for the wrong application. You have a great method, I'm sorry, you have a great method, but for the wrong application. It could be a great ranking method, but not a good uh, predictive method. So that's what you have to be careful of. So what we're looking for is a crystal ball. That's what we want. I want to somehow take all this data, have no idea what's going on in the sport, not even be a sports fan, and there it is, because I do math. I see it right there. 
But it's math. It's a math model. It's a model. Even human models are not real. It's called Photoshop. It's not the real thing. A toy model you build, and it's not the. If it was a plane, you built a plane. You didn't build a model plane. It's a model. So what we really have is we have a cloudy crystal ball. That is ever important in what we're doing, because if you do not remember that, you can actually bog yourself down instantly, because you can go, oh wait a minute, but that may not be right. It's not going to be right. It, you're looking for a model that you can pull out information probably more than you could otherwise. I was on the radio yesterday with MSN, and, the, and one of the hosts said, well, I, I've been known for my handicapping for a long time. Why do I need math? You may not. But the math will not have the subjectivity that you have. And it can be another voice, a voice apart from yours, that can inform what you're doing. But it won't be right, so you may want to override it. But just as I said to him, if you do override it and you're wrong, I'll remind you that you overrided the math, so be careful. All right, so we're going to apply this to bracketology at some point. Bracketology is just a loose term that um, people have created to make it sound like we're doing something academic. Um, to get down to what, how it works, if you're not a fan, you came because a friend was coming. The way it works is that this year on March 15th, there will be what's called Selection Sunday. Uh, that's a very important day for teams like Davidson. We play Division I sports, so we may be selected for uh, the NCAA tournament. Right now, we will be selected. Uh, what, there's a lot to happen, so we don't know. So you have these initial pairings, and then your job to make a bracket is to pig, figure out who you predict will win these first round matches. This is called the first round. You make those predictions, then from those predicted winners, you determine who you think will win. So this is the second round. Then you have your third round matchups, and you predict until finally you have a national champion. You enter that because the tournament has not happened. And when, then when the tournament unfolds, you get so many points for each correct prediction. How many points? It depends on the pool that you're in. It depends what you're trying to say is good. It depends what you're trying to say is important. It can be upsets. There's all kinds of ways that people measure it. But the one that we participate in is the ESP, ESPN online tournament. Why? Because millions of brackets are submitted. And we did it originally as a research tool. We had new research, which you'll learn tonight. And the question was, does it do anything? It's a ranking method. It will rank. Here you go. But it was, does it mean anything? And we went, you know what? This is a predictive tool. Why don't we try March Madness? And we beat 97% of 4 million brackets. When we did that, I probably would have been happy with 60%. I would have been like, yeah, yeah, it's better than like half the people out there. Then we got 97%. So the next year, it's like we're sweating bullets. It's like, whew, man, whew. we got 99.9% .9 the next year. And that was a student in class. So you would, right now, we're, what, we're not quite halfway. We're a little bit into the first class. Took three periods, and boom, there we did. We were ready. I even teach it to the low-level I hate math class. We just don't talk about all the math that derives it. You'll learn some of that. I can't teach it all to, all to you. And they've done real well. Um, the next year, we were in the 78th percentile. So just be careful. That was the year that Butler went so far. And um, it took, there was a dominant school that won the, won the tournament. I've forgotten who. If you have a huge alumni following then um, you're dead. And so just, it, it just dropped. But we couldn't find uh, sports analysts that did better. So it's just one of those years. So it just depends. All right. So really quick, a couple little math parts of this in terms of the, um, the kind of predictability of this type of problem is that you have 32 games. There are 64, games that, or 64 teams that play in what's called the first round. And there are actually 68 teams that enter the tournament, and there are play-in games. But let's just not talk about that because it's confusing. You don't have to predict those. So there are 32 games, and then there are 63 games total. So all you have to do is predict 63 games. That's it. And yet we call it madness. And we say, oh, I already told you I'm not going to help you get a perfect bracket. So I'm already being pessimistic about, good grief, 63 games. Well, let's talk a second about that. It's not easy at all. 
Because for one thing, you're trying to predict the behavior of 18 to 22-year-old guys under high-stress situations, which is not predictable. Secondly, it's just hard because sports have two things in it. It's very important to understand. Sports has an element of skill, and it has an element of luck. I am trying to do data mining, if you will, data science on the skill. I'm generally not trying to predict the luck because it's luck. It's random. You can induce that into what you do, but it's random. So you're just saying, here we go. And then you just plop that in. You can put a random number generator and do that. That's fine. But you're, again, once you do that, you're totally saying it's not going to be perfect unless I'm really lucky. Last year in 2014, out of 11 million brackets submitted to ESPN's online tournament, there were no perfect brackets after the thir first 32 games. That's how hard it can be. Part of it, there was a team, Dayton, that did really well. Our daughter had that pick. She got it. She's eight. She was seven at the time. Why? Because she thought the word was pretty. I just can't compete with that sometimes. <laughs> Last year, if, you're not, if you didn't somehow meet, miss the media tsunami on this, is that Warren Buffett insured a billion-dollar prize for the perfect bracket. He had 8 million brackets in his, I think I'm right, 8 million brackets in his pool because you could only submit once. He did have perfect brackets after that, but after the Dayton win in the second round, it went away. There were no longer perfect brackets. I knew the guy that did some of the math behind whether Buffett would make the challenge, and then he emailed, or he, he tweeted, actually, he publicly tweeted me and just went, all he wrote was, it's over, and then that meant there were no more perfect brackets that particular year. Sometimes there's just upsets that probably 99.9% .9 of the time that team is going, there's a team that's going to win. But that doesn't mean on that day, in that moment, it's going to happen. Last year, Mercer, very small liberal arts college outside Atlanta, beat Duke. I was at a recreational math conference and we were doing these, these like mathematical tinker toy constructions which in most audiences gets a huge laugh and I have to deal with that. But you know, in this audience, that sounds really cool. So, um, so it's nice. So we, um, we were building things and then someone came out and they said, to the, I was with Mercer faculty, they said, you guys just beat Duke. Can you think what their response was? At what? <laughs> At March Madness. What? You beat Duke in March Madness. Oh my gosh, I've got one of those athletes in my class. He has a test on Friday. We made no contingency plans whatsoever. <laughs> so anyway, it's maddening sometimes to the faculty, but nonetheless, that's the case. So first of all, we need to talk about how many brackets are actually possible because sometimes just if you do work in combinatorics, Things grow really fast, and we don't always have intuition on fast. I mean, there's fast, and then there's when you're a mathematician. Fast is, fast is really fast. So there are 2 to the 63rd, or 9 quintillion brackets. So it's 9 with 18 zeros after it. So how big is that number? What is that number? I only know that number because I get interviewed about it each year. Well, if you could produce 1 billion unique brackets per second, how long would it take to create 9 quintillion? So just think in yourself, what do you think? A year? A month, 10 years, what do you think? Yeah, that's getting there, 300 years. That's nine quintillion. So if you're sitting there thinking, I'm going brute force, CS, math CS, <clears throat> by the time you do that, you're not going to care, and neither will anyone else, because you can have a perfect bracket pretty quickly when the tournament's over. Okay. Now, this is the part I want to talk about, is that in, bra in sports ranking, not really bracketology, it's, it's true here too, but it's true very much in the broader field if you're interested in sports analytics. In sports analytics, if we get a 1% to 2% increase in accuracy, it's everything. We go, ooh, wow, really? That's great. And sometimes people from the outside will go, good grief, that's horrible. Well, let's just talk about it in this context. The historical accuracy, uh, so when you get the uh, nine quintillion brackets, that's like flipping a coin. That's like saying 50-50 chance on any game. Well, that's just not true. A 16 seed has never beat a one seed. They've come close, but they have not won. So you're pretty safe saying in the first round that that's what's going to happen. 
But you can't just go by seeding because if you're familiar with bracketology, like 512, there's just some hex put over that combination in March Madness because there's almost always an upset there. So historically, it's been 70%. 70% when people put in brackets, that's about how accurate they tend to be. And it just varies. Sometimes somebody does really well. Well, that means that rather than 1 over 2 to the negative 63rd to tell you how many brackets there are, 0.5 to the 63rd, I think, I don't know if I have that quite right, um, you get 5.7 billion, okay? That's your odds of a perfect bracket. Then you just go one, you get a 1% increase, and look how much it drops. You get a 2% increase, and there you go. That's why we do the work we do. That's part of the reason why we can be better. Can I use 5,000 games can I look at the results of 5,000 games, determine which of those 5,000 games are predictive of what will happen in a way that you can just not intake yourself? And that's what we look for. Okay, so what we're going to do is you're, we're going to use a graph structure to represent the games. And the way it works is that the nodes or the vertices um, will be the teams. So this is the Davidson Wildcats, and this is Wisconsin. And it is a directed graph, so there is an edge, a directed edge, an arrow that points. And this is the bad sportsmanship graph. So what happens is if I've beaten you, I point at you, and I keep pointing it out. I beat you. This happened uh, in 2008, so I'm still pointing out to Wisconsin. I beat you. So that's this graph. If that feels, if that just makes you uncomfortable, you could switch it because it's just a convention. But that's the one we use. All right, so this is Moody for an energizing professor. So that I have talked way more than enough, and I need you to get intuition on ranking. So we will do a few of these. Here is the first one. So I need you to turn to someone next to you and talk about how you would rank this. But this is very important. You do not need to agree. So if at some point you don't agree, talk about why. Because in ranking, in an applied math, and in data analytics, when you do not agree, that is when you can find new research directions. Because there's something you may be seeing that we haven't thought before. All right, talk about this one, then we'll move to another one. Okay, I'll ask for your attention. This is fun. It occurred to me I'm at Harvey Mudd. I ask you to look this, and you start talking about in degree, out degree. Possibly this one doesn't. This one doesn't. You don't have a cycle, but um, you those types of discussions. I did this at Virginia Tech, which is a very, very serious sports school. It was only with the math department, and it was like it was kind of like now, where you guys are in a very busy time. It was right before Christmas. They're like, you know, I don't know. There could be five people here who all know you. And like, you know, your mom drove up and was one of them, you know, and it's like, I don't know, it'll be what it'll be. But, you know, it's a very serious sports school. So like there was faculty and there were grad students and undergrads, so they were lining thing. And I showed them this slide. And like, I, I think they only talked about the math for 15 seconds, maybe 10. And then they're putting teams on it. Yeah, that's like Notre Dame, man. That's like when they went down, back, it was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> it's like, no, man, I'm not done. You know, so it was really fascinating. So this is called the perfect season. If you want to put a label on it, this is what we call the perfect season. And sometimes this is what you need to do research. You have to make this assumption or you're not proving anything because things just get so complicated. It's the perfect season because D beat everyone, C lost only to D, A beat only B, and B is Davidson football. They lost to everyone. So that was us last year. We are number, how many teams are there? So anyway. We had a hard time. This year we won one game. We won our first game against a school that I still don't know where they're from. But nonetheless, we brought them in. So we have a hard time. Now sometimes people go, that's just ridiculous. That never happens. That's just, what's with you? But I want to point out that this was a couple years ago. 
in North Carolina. Now, this is not a North Carolina talk. If it was, I would now have a two-minute period of silence why people needed to vent what just, I just showed. What happened is Duke beat University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Um, so this is, the, oh, I've forgotten the labels on the last slide. So then, um, University of North Carolina, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, I'm sorry, that's just that's inbred in me now, uh, lost only to Duke. Uh, North Carolina State beat only Wake Forest, and Wake Forest lost to the other three. But the fact that people respond the way they do, that they would go, wait a minute, okay, maybe we lost to the th three of you, but you lost to, and we didn't. Exactly. You do not rank by only the way that the teams play against each other, because you're throwing away a lot of other information. So when we rank in the end for March Madness, we use all Division I teams. Now, you may not actually agree with that choice. You may say, well, wait a minute. Over Christmas break, Davidson plays Division II and Division III games. You should bring those in. Maybe you want to. I don't. Why? Because I think it induces noise. We're supposed to win. We do win. Once we pounded on them hard enough, then we put in, I mean, I could play. I mean, it's just we just have such a huge lead. You can ask me later. I'll try to bring it up later why that also induces a problem in terms of the ranking. I won't do it right now because we haven't seen the method. Okay, so here's another one. The one on the left is the one you just did. Does that look familiar? Okay. The one on the right is exactly the same structure, except I changed the labels. Do you see that? It's important for what we do next. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're going to have F beat D. All right, so you can turn to the same partner, but you're free to change. So if it's like, I kind of need to change the discussion, then find a new partner. But talk about this again. How would you rank? Okay, I know I'm shortchanging you a little bit, but I just needed you to have that much discussion because now I need this to be the change. Now E beats D. What would you do here? Okay, notice I'm not asking how you will rank. You don't have to go that far, although you may want to. But what would you do here? Talk about that now. Okay, so there's an important difference between those two graphs. There are many, and there are many that you may have seen and you have discussed, but there's only one that I want to talk about. The one that I want to talk about is what happened to D. What I mean by that is there is a very good chance that between these two different losses, that made an impact in how you were going to rank D. That is exactly why you cannot use winning percentage as a means to predict. Winning percentage is not a good predictive measure unless all the teams are ranked the same, or have the same strength, and that's just true. If that's true, then overall that might give you some indication. I still would say you shouldn't do it, but nonetheless, there are ways that you can pull that out. But that is why we need something more. We need to have a sense of the strength of loss. Two years ago, when people played Davidson in football, they beat us. They should have beat us. They did beat us because we were defeated, and we were going to be defeated. We just had a very, very hard football year. If someone had lost to us, you needed to know that because what happened to that team? Whereas in, the case, in other cases, like in basketball this year, we're incredibly strong, and that's important to know. That's what we want to fold into this. Well, my area is linear algebra. You tell me that these things are interdependent. You tell me that, well, what, come on. That means you've got to know them all at one time. That's called a linear solve. What's x and y that solve these equations at the same time? I don't know. 
Exactly. Just solve the thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, there they are. Wow, I should have thought of that. The difference now is that you do 350 at one time for 350 equations. Is that a lot? I don't know, not to me. Why? Because my PhD, we did 1.5 million equations with 1.5 million unknowns. That was what my PhD was related to. What are they? I don't know. That's why you get computers to have fast and efficient and stable algorithms to do it. Okay? All right, so let's move forward. So what we did is that my... I don't have that on the slide. My main researcher is Amy Langville at the College of Charleston. Amy and I worked together, and what we did was we adapted methods that were used by the Bowl Championship Series. So up to this year, it was partially what helped select who would be at the Rose Bowl and, and that type of thing. It would rank them. And those, metals, those, metals, those models take in strength of schedule. It makes a difference who D lost to, and that's what we'll see. So the thing I like about this, particularly uh, in these kinds of settings where you're in college, is that this actually, the, the method comes from Ken Massey, who is a professor at Carson Newman College, and it, it was developed in his honors math project at Bluefield College. So it actually is developed out of undergraduate work, which I think, he's not the only one to develop it, but um, it definitely came out of that. So this is the method. There are two. There's one called Coley, which I'll refer to at the end, and one Massey. Coley is a little hard to see. Uh, particularly on a Friday night where you were willing to come. And um, Massey is a little easier to see, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that one, uh, particularly if you've had some linear algebra. If you haven't, um, you can still understand the, the uh, premise of the method. So what we're going to do is we're using a directed graph, but now we're going to have a weighted directed graph where the weight is the what's called point differential. So what this means is Duke beat UNC Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, by 10 points. What was the score? I don't know. All I know is they won by 10. Then UNC, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, beat Wake Forest by 5. Does that mean that Duke will beat Wake Forest by 15? Of course not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have such long seasons because we wouldn't need it anymore. Be like, okay, we're done. That's why we don't watch. It may not even be that Duke wins. We just don't know. That's part of it. We know often sometimes what will happen. In fact, I was at the MIT Sports Analytics meeting. It was phenomenal. In this panel, the panelist, this data head, just us, the mathematician goes, actually, we've learned that halfway through the second quarter, we already know who's going to win a football game. Two athletes look at the, the math person. Can you think? Um, I might not say that was true for the most recent football game. The Super Bowl, we didn't know until one second left. Or was there any time left on that thing? By the way, I lived in Seattle. My son was born in Seattle, so that is the end of that discussion because that was a very harsh moment in our house. Well, this is not true. If it was true, it's called transitivity of scores. If you ever want to play with something, go to Ken Massey's site. It's Massey, MasseyRatings.com. Somewhere, his site's a little hard to maneuver through, but he's got this one part where you can put in any Division I team. Maybe you can even put in Division III team. I don't know. But you put in two football teams. Oh, yeah, because we're Division I, but not, we're non-scholarship Division I football. And um, <laughs> you put them in, and it'll show you a path from one team to the other team that makes whoever you want better than the other team, as if transitivity held. So, like, you know, that was our defeated year. So I put in Davidson and Alabama. It took, like, 80, you know, oh, no, no, that year you couldn't do it because we lost everybody. So we had to go back a year because then we did win. And so it was this hilarious path. It was like, oh, there you go. And so um, that was its own research question at one point. I, I forget what it was, but I was trying to look at the length of paths versus something else. Um, we never totally got there on that one. All right, but can it be held approximately? I'm an applied mathematician. I'm okay with stuff not being exact. Can it be close enough that it works? But right there, when I see approximate, I can live with that. But every single time I worry about, when do you not know? That, is our re that research question is three weeks old. Not quite that. But what we're wondering is, can, right now, Amy and I want to look at, I'm on sabbatical next year, so we're hoping that we can look at, if you know how many times transitivity breaks down in a network, can you say when the graph is actually rankable? When can you produce a ranking that you think is predictive enough of what you're doing, whether it's the web or anything else? It will rank, but that it is believable in what it does. So that's one of the types of things you can look at. 
Okay, so here we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for the ratings of the teams. Rating is not rank. It will not pop out and say one, two, three. It will give you a numeric number, and then the higher number, the better the team. So then you sort it, and then the highest, if you're doing it in descending order, the highest team is the, um, the best. Okay, so R1 will be, um, is it Duke? R1 is Duke, R2 is UNC Chapel Hill, and R3 will represent the rating for Wake Forest. So I have the 10 and the 5 win from earlier, and then in a very close game, Wake Forest beat Duke. The way you set up the system is you're assuming that the ratings actually will tell you the predicted uh, score differential between the teams. Can you see that? Is that you have R1, the rating for Duke, minus R2, the rating for UNC. That's 10. So that's saying those ratings will give you that. That's very important later in terms of what this method tells you. So R2 minus R3 is 5. 2, 3, and then R3 minus R1 is 1. There it is right there. Okay? So this is actually a singular system. You can't solve that. There is no solution. And it turns out that generally you don't have three games. We'll have 350 teams, but approximately 5,000 games. So this is a long, skinny matrix that you have. And in fact, you do least squares. It's a least squares problem. You may remember that from linear algebra. It may make, I don't know, maybe not in Harvey Mudd. There's a lot of colleges where once I say that, it's like, oh, okay, you can go on now. And so it's just the least squares that we have. One way to derive least squares in terms of the way to do it is to multiply it on the left by M transpose. Um, for those faculty here who do numerical analysis, please don't freak out because it's generally not the best way to do it numerically. It is nice in this context because um, the condition number often isn't that big. And um, you can get directly to M transpose quite quickly, which is what I'll show you. The problem then is that you have what's called zero row sum. So it means we did all this work and we still got a singular system. The reason it's singular even at that moment is because, remember I told you I didn't tell you the score differential? I just said that R1 minus R2 is 10. Well, you can shift things any way you want. So you've got to lock them down. You've got to go right there. That's where I want you to be. So that's what we do here. We replace in, this is called the normal equations. In M transpose M, that, a matrix, in the last row, you replace it with ones. And then on the right-hand side, the, the vector, you put a zero. And that means that the sum of the ratings is zero. So that locks it down, and it becomes a um, system that you can solve. OK, so I want to show you really quick how easy this is to do in code. I'll do this fairly fast, because I want to show you a few other things that research ideas. And I want to share a research idea that came up during the T that's, been, that's not um, basketball that I can um, share with you, that you could be involved. I'd love to have you involved with it. All right, so here's our pretend season. So um, Davidson is near Charlotte, North Carolina. So this is the North Carolina, um, Panth uh, the Carolina Panthers, which that stadium is about 20 miles from our house. I do ranking. So in this system, um, you probably can be very predictive about who will be number one. So we're in the south division of the NFL. We have our directed, directed graph. And it turns out that you can go directly to the linear system. You don't have to do the R1 minus R2 business. You can go directly there just looking at this very quickly for those of you who code. So what you do is, first of all, you, um, I talk about it as enumerate the rows. You give each row an association to a team, which I've done here. So if you don't follow football, this is the Saints or the Gold Helmets. This is the Buccaneers from Tampa Bay, also the Pirate Flag people. Um, this is the Carolina Panthers, which um, Wildcats, something. And this is the Birds or the uh, Atlanta Falcons. So you can call them any of those if you have a question. Once you assign the rows, you get the same um, association with the columns. Once you have that, you're ready to fill it in. And we have two things. We have the diagonal matrix and then the off-diagonal. On the diagonal, it's quite easy. This is the Massey method, again, for Ken Massey. It was named after him. He's not terribly fond of that because the method goes broader than him. But nonetheless, it's become known as the Massey method. Is on the diagonal, you just simply look at, where am I? I'm at the Saints. How many games did they play? I think in our graph, it might have been two. If it is, then you put a two there. If the Buccaneers played three games, you put a three. So it's exactly how many games they played. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm one, one slide ahead of that. There you go. OK. Oh, I'm on the off-diagonal. OK, we can do the off-diagonal. So on the off-diagonal, what you do is you look at who is in the row and the column. So this is the Saints and the Buccaneers. OK, so when you look at that, you say, how many games did they play? They played one, they played two, how many did they play? And you just put negative of that number. That's it. The diagonal is how many teams did the team play. 
The off diagonal is how many teams did those two teams play. Can anybody see what's missing in this? There's important information that's kind of important to how teams play that we've not integrated yet. Yeah, who won and lost? It's kind of like helpful. And so that's called the right-hand side. So that's where that comes in. Okay? So real quick, this is what we have for the system. Let's be sure we can go through that. Let's just do one row. So we have the first row, which is the Saints. If you remember, that would be right here. So you look at the total number of, um, of edges coming in or out. It's two. That goes right there. And then you look at the Buccaneers. They played one game. And then with the um, uh, Falcons, they played one game. Really quick, if you're going to do this, pro well, I'll show it to you in a couple slides. I'll wait and point that out to the faculty. There's one thing. <laughs> If you're going to ever assign this, you want to keep in mind. You only make the mistake once, so it won't matter too much. But all right, then the right-hand side, it gets the same association with the vectors. And then each, each element gets what's called the point differential of um, the scores. And I do that in text, unfortunately, here. And what that is is that if you win, it's positive. If you lose, it's negative. So I say it here, but let's just go to the slide. Here, the Saints won by 7 and then lost by three. So right there, you put seven minus three, which is four. See it? Let's verify the second one. The Buccaneers, they won by 17, lost by three, lost by seven. So it's 17 minus 10, or seven. OK? That's it. Sort of. It's almost it, because once you form that system, which I have here, do you remember what we have to do to it? We have to replace the last row and put a zero there. You don't have to. But then you're going to get code that goes, I don't know what you're doing. It's singular. Like, what? Come on. This is supposed to work. So you'll eventually remember. Really quick, if you ever do this in class, I do this in both my non-major class and for math majors. If you ever do this, you want to tell the students the enumeration. If you do not, it will take a very, very long time to grade because you're going to have to think every um, nuance of the way they change the numbers. So anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so there I've done it. The ones and the zero, I've locked it down. Then I solved the system, and there you got it. Okay, bigger is better. So the Panthers are number one because that's where I live. Then we have the Buccaneers. Then we have the Saints. And finally, we have the Falcons, which um, I'm not against Atlanta because um, I like Coke. But nonetheless, that's just where I put them. Okay, but there's something to notice here. Um, one of the reasons, can anybody see one of the big reasons that the Falcons lost? It's hidden in the system. Can anybody see it? That 17-point loss, that 17-point loss played really big into that. One of the things about this method is that blowouts play into this. Oh, I'll come back to this in a quick second. Blowouts play into this big. This is a real game. Can you actually decipher what that says? That took me a little while. 222 to 0. I mean, did Cumberland just, like, drive home for the second half? I mean, gee, man, I mean, if you actually sit down and work that out, it's like, you were scoring every, like, five seconds. I mean, not quite, but it's just absolutely incredible. You really don't want to take that into account. Sometimes, like, if you look at the code that I'll show you online, you can cap it. And that means everything over a 20-point win is the same, and you can do those types of things. One quick thing here, and then I'll move ahead. I'm going to run a little bit over, and I apologize for that. I was trying to hit 50 on the dot, but I wanted to show you more because uh, many of you will be able to do this yourself. The point differential tells you, remember, the expected point differential between the teams. Last year, when we were producing that, if you looked at the number one through the number 10 team, the point differential was less than one point. That was an indicator that last year was going to be a bumpy, difficult year, and it was. This year, Warren Buffett has not put a billion-dollar prize on it. He talked about it, but he didn't do it. Why? Because I think... We will not see. I think at least as of January, it looked like it wouldn't be a bumpy ride. Am I right? I don't know. There's no way they're going to tell me. But I think in, we have research, a very new result that we think helps us predict upsetability. We actually need a couple more games, and I, it's not like I'm trying to be elusive. I just, we just don't know yet for this year. I can tell you later how that works if you want to. I'll tell you afterwards. So the other one is the Coley method. The Coley method looks only at wins and losses. Last year, the Coley method did very well. The Massey method did not. It was just too close. The, these point, like you're a 60-point win, and you only win by 40. Then suddenly you're a weaker team than you should have been because you just laid off. That's why, remember earlier when I said we don't put Division three teams in? That's why. Because if you do, it can create noise that's artificial. With the, with the Coley method, it's really nice because the system is exactly the same as the Massey system before you put the ones in. You just add two to the diagonal. 
In the right-hand side, this is fast, but I'll show you places you can find it. You just put 1 plus 1 half wins minus losses. That's called Laplace's rule of secession. It's a Bayesian-type approach. If you haven't played anything, I'm going to assume that there's a 50-50 chance. That's just one half. There's a 50-50 chance I'm going to win. But as you play more games, I'm going to fold that in to the predictability of where you'll go. So that's where that's coming from. If you want more information on that, this is the book that Art mentioned. Um, it's in there. It's also in the, the uh, 2010 Math Awareness Month book, which is a book. So if you really like things bound, you can get that but it's online, it, all the papers are online and free. I have a free course on Udemy. If you, were, if you came up to me at Davidson and said, I want to do this at Davidson, you said you wanted to do it, I'd ask you to watch that. And if someone on the swim team at Davidson watched this, he came in, he has a new research result we're trying to implement for this year. So you, you can be independent on that. And this is my edX course that's running right now. You could join it right now and catch up. Part one is very simple. It ports down to high school, and part two will be largely data mining and, you have more in it, but all of it's at the undergraduate uh, linear algebra level. So March Madness, how does it work? We rank, and then we just assume the higher ranked team work, wins. That's it. That's a math-based bracket. It's that simple. So in this, if this was the round robin, we'd assume that Davidson beat, and this is Charleston, because not just because I'm from Davidson, but because that's the ranking. Well, it is because I'm from Davidson, but that's the ranking I made. Then we have Furman and Appalachia State. And then we'd assume Furman won because um, Furman is ranked higher in this particular method, which it sounds one person would rerun the results. And then Davidson would win um, in this particular math bracket that we have. Now, this is the part where you can make your own particular method. Now, I'm, I'm already a little bit out of time, and I'm already doing this. But this is how simple it is. What you do is you actually look at the season or any other part of the data that you have and you ask, what do you think is predictive? And when you think it's predictive, like let's just take time. It's, we talk about it as recency. That's the term that Nate Silver uses a lot for his political, um, his political rankings. In recency, you'd say games up to it are more important. So in a game that's close to the tournament, you would give it more weight, like 1.5. So if you and I played ping pong and we're so into the ma this Massey method, we're going to have a tournament and do the Massey method on it because, man, linear algebra rocks. Well, if it's predictive, then that means when you win, you get 1.5 wins and I get 1.5 losses. If it's not predictive because we played back in, in September when you came to campus, I, I think that, I don't know if that's your calendar, but whatever, then, then you would get half a win and I would get half a loss, Okay. That's it. You can put functions on that. You can econ majors do all this like exponential stuff on it, diminishing return type thing. It's like, holy mackerel. Whatever you want, you can do. And so this is a simple one, but one that I often do with people who are not mathematicians. I have a friend who had never done math with his sons because he's not good at math. He just wishes he could do math with his kids. Is you just tell me how many parts you want it, the season broken into. So here it would be two. And then you just tell me the weights. That actually does surprisingly well as a ranking method. Even that can improve your rankings. So here are th four methods that we've looked at. Beating teams of similar ability. So this is one where you actually use clustering. To, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not what this is. This is when you run the Massey method twice. You run the Massey method once. Then you look at who has close ratings to each other. You have to determine what close is. Then you run it again. And if you are playing a team close to your ability and you can win, I, well, then if you're playing a team close to your ability, I upweight what happens. If you can't beat a team close to you, you get hit hard. If you can beat a team close to you, you get, you, get, you get more of a bump. If you can do that against good teams, then you get even more of a bump. Winning at home or away, that was the 99.9% .9 bracket that we had. That was the first time we'd included that. Sustained win streaks, that was the only bracket that picked Butler in that year that we struggled, is that she upweighted the ability for sustained win streaks. If you're going to code this, I'll show you at the end where it is. If you want to code it, come up and ask me. It's very easy to do. So, you, well, unless, you know, you want to be macho math. I'm doing it on my own. Then just do it. But if you want to know, you can ask. And then winning close games. That's the one we're doing a lot of work on this year. That's the one the swim team guy got this year. So that's about three weeks old. Okay. So what's your ideal weight? Some of us answer that in different ways. Some of us just don't even ask that anymore. But anyway, all right. So what we've done is entered this into the ESPN challenge because there are millions of brackets. You get 10 points for the first round. Then each successive round is double the previous round. 
So in 2009, that was the 97th percentile. Next year, I taught it in class. It was 99th percentile. This is the website. It'll be on the last slide that has the code in a more automated form. And then in 2014, it got covered by various media, and it was run over 12,000 times from Selection Sunday through the Wednesday. Through, so it's really Monday to Wednesday. And it was run 3,000 times on a day that it hit Reddit, even before the tournament started. So that was kind of cool, although Davidson College was kind of like, what's going on with the math server? You know, so anyway, it was kind of fun. If you are not a, a, but you like World Cup soccer, you can go to FIFA Faux Fun, which is a fun name when you read it, but was very tricky on the radio. And um, it, it does World Cup soccer. So it did pick Brazil, um, but so did everyone else. And, um, and it was run by over, in over 80 countries. And so really quick, I just want to make a couple final points. There's one thing that happened in this talk that's very important. We started with football. Do you remember that? This is a football ranking method. And then it moved to basketball, and then just now it moved to soccer. That's a big thing in applied math, is you take your ideas and you recycle them and reuse them. But they do have to change. They don't just port immediately over. So I want to show you a few ways that this has opened up other avenues for me and for others in ranking. A year ago, we worked with Twizu, which is a startup company, a very successful startup company in London. And that idea was to take rating or um, comments of restaurants in London to rank the sentiment of it and then to rank the restaurants off the sentiment. That was cool. So I worked with an AI, artificial intelligence professor at Davidson. He did the sentiment analysis and we did the ranking. Another one is that I had a researcher doing ranking on Friday. He talked to a company. They wanted to talk about it. He gave the presentation to them on Friday, and on Monday he was working for them. Sortable.com, what were they sorting? They weren't. They had another website. It was cage fighting. So we were suddenly doing cage fighting research. So um, I don't know a whole lot about basketball, but I can guarantee you I know a lot less about cage fighting. So... Um, Anyway, we, our field research was watching that movie with the mall cop actor that, where he's doing cage fighting. I mean, you know, whatever. And so the reason these guys have a chest piece on their shoulder is um, the method they were using uses what's called ELO ranking. It's the same uh, rating method that uh, Nate Silver uses for soccer. I don't know why ours did so much better. It could have been the status set they gave us. Remember I said 1% or 2% is good? On ours, ours did 12% better in predicting than theirs. So um, that kind of worried me. It sounds great, but when you get that, you assume you're wrong. So um, it, it was nice, but I, it, I don't know. I'm not really sure. But nonetheless, they did take elements of what we did, and it's improved their method. A couple other things beyond ranking is that last year I worked on a fantasy sports algorithm so that, that actually sets the uh, salaries of the teams, and it works for any sport that you have. That was, that was, really a, that was very hard, but it was quite fun. And then I'm doing ranking uh, or uh, um, problems, I'm sorry, for the NBA related to officiating analytics. So that's trying to make the officials better. Finally, I'm in the home of NASCAR, so I've worked on things with NASCAR. Some people think that's the least interesting thing we do. But NASCAR is high engineering and um, an interesting, difficult problem. So if you're interested in those, any of those, you can let me know. If you're interested in the NBA, they're hiring. If you're a senior, um, the director of officiating an analytics is hiring people. So if you talk to your professor and you, I have to give a good recommendation. I don't actually like saying that, but I do because it will come from me. But if your professor tells me that you're a good student and I can recommend you, I will recommend you to the NBA. It'll be a 10-month project. It's not full-time for all time. He does 10 months at a time. But I'd be very willing to do that for you. Okay? And so, oh, yeah, and then two of the students who worked with me, one works for the Sixers and one works for the Bulls, which is kind of fun. I'd like to say I could sustain that. So anyway, who's number one can move you into many other things. The last thing I want to show you is a problem that you can work on that's coming out of my MOOC. You don't need to join the MOOC. In most cases, you would. There are two groups that don't have to. One are any student at Davidson can do this separate from the MOOC. And now those of you at Harvey Mudd could too. So if you're interested in this problem, I would love to have you involved. Oops, sorry. I'm not used to running movies within my talks. So here you go. Oops, we don't have the sound. That's strange. It worked earlier. Okay, I'll tell you the problem. John Brankus is a mime. He's doing that for you now, so I will narrate what he's doing. The problem is that the Cubs have not won the World Series in 100 years. And the question is why? So you have four answers. A, because they've not put the money into it. B, because they don't have the personnel. Three, because they're cursed. And four, because of a reason that you think up. 
We went to the sports science lab, my wife and I, yesterday morning. First thing they asked us, how is the problem going? When will you have the answer, and when are you going to call us? You can work on that problem. Will they put it on TV? I don't know. But they don't ask questions like that because they feel like it. They ask it because they want to know. I would love to have you involved in doing that. You don't even ha you can unveil it to me. But tell me if you're working on it. You don't have to, you're not promising a solution. Just say, I want to work on it. If you just, I'm the only Tim and da Tim Davidson mime, and I did something with Yoda. Between all that, you're going to find me. In math, put in math, and then you'd find me. So my thing for you is that you can get in the analytic game. You can play the game of ranking. You can play the game of bracketology. And the one thing I've, I mentioned at the beginning but I didn't quite say to you is that you do not have to know sports. It's often the non-sports fan that does the best ranking. Because if you're a huge sports fan, you are going to say there's no way in the world that that's true. And you overfit. Will you? I already saw one person go, no way, man. It's not happening. That's fine. But don't, you have to take the voice of the math, what you say in your modeling, to be truth. But the 99 percentile was both. He was both a sports fan and a, math, a very good mathematician. The next year, the best bracket came from somebody who had never done a bracket in her life. I'm not even sure she knew what a basketball was. But she did really well because she talked to people. This is, this is not, do you remember, this is the site that you go to to use ours. This is where you download all of my code. It has Java, Python, and MATLAB, and it has all the data up to last year. I did, this is the Museum of Math. I did a fundraiser for them, and I wasn't allowed to release anything. But you paid to go to MoMath to get my codes. Well, you paid to fly my wife here and I, and I wouldn't even do it just for that, because I want you to try it. But it's just not a public link. But if you can think of somebody who would enjoy it, feel free to share it. I'm sorry for taking 10 extra minutes. I hope and thank you. Well, first, I thank you for coming on a Friday, and I thank you for your attention. We, we do have time for a, a few questions. In the 1990s, the reason that people did so well on the stock market was because they were applying analytics just like you see in Moneyball. So it's very much a similar thing. But when I gave this talk to a Wall Street firm, um, they wanted the hour and a half version, and then they asked me questions for 45 minutes. So um, it's related, which is partially what you're asking about. But I ha I've tried um, Wall Street. And uh, I'm not saying um, I, I'm, if it worked, I wouldn't tell you. Um, but I can tell you it didn't work. So <laughs> anybody else? There's one over here. How far do I have Davis in my personal bracket? I don't have my personal bracket yet. But right um, when my student did it two days ago, now we won a huge game last night uh, against VCU, and we beat them really big. So we will be much stronger. I believe in the Massey method today. Um, the, uh, the, we were 40th um, on Wednesday night. And it is possible to get a bracket where uh, Kentucky is not on top. I, I'm not sure anyone's going to ask that, but it seemed like a question you might ask. Yeah. variability of performance of teams. Yes, one of the things we've been doing this year is we've been trying to find the standard deviation of the teams. And so there's two things we've been doing this year with that. The, the answer is yes in many ways, but to give a brief answer. One is that we're trying to create brackets right now that, that fill in as far as it can with, we're pretty certain this is the way you should rank according to your method. But according to, because you get to choose your weights, but then when it doesn't know, it stops and then you have to use some other intuition, and then it'll fill in. That's based on partial ordering, because this is a full ordering, and that's a way to pull in partial ordering instead. And then the other thing with variability, if you look at the residual vector, we've tried to look at the, the it, um, you had like MR equal B. You take MR minus B, it would be zero if it was perfect. If you look at that, um, it's a little different what you're asking, but you can look at that vector and see the fit. In, in that the lack of fit is sometimes that variability. It's not quite what you're asking, because that call gets kind of folded in there. But yes, there's a lot there, and we've never totally cracked it, so I'm not to quite sure. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever done ranking of players, like who's the MVP, and like how like trading works and stuff like that? We have. Um, 
I'll talk about two things. I'm sorry. I do some work that's um, confidential with the team, so I always have to think about what I'm allowed to talk about. This one I am allowed to talk about. The first one we did for an MBA team. I just can't tell you which one. But we did it for an MBA team, and we were doing age curves where we did clustering. So we clustered on data to find which players were similar. And then you find um, they're similar, but how similar? So like the distance, even though you're similar. And then you try to find, <laughs> the goal was to figure out when they were at their peak, get them at the peak, slightly beyond, and then trade them so that you get to watch their decline. So it sounded better when we did the work. But um, <laughs> um, oh, and then the other one, which is really fun, if you're a baseball fan, they ranked the game. So when you do this stuff, if you're going to do ranking methods like Massey and Coley, what's the game? The game was the pitcher versus the batter. In the score, there's like some baseball almanac that says the expected value in everything that can happen at play. So even if you strike out, there is a non, there's a, there's a positive, like, because you could, I guess, strike out and they, they advance or I don't know. Um, but they gave that the score. And then they ranked the pitchers versus the batters and then they separated them. And they were able to find pitchers that had weak defenses behind them, were traded the stronger defenses, and had fabulous years the next year. And that was done at Furman. That's why Furman beat um, Appalachia State, because they collaborate. And I put uh, Charleston third, because Amy's my friend. <laughs> yes? How do you take into account? I'll repeat it. That's fine. How, how do you take into account uh, when you know a key player is injured? in the ratings and in your predictions for, for future games? How do we take into account the injury of players? We don't. But if you wanted to, the way that you do it is, for instance, there was a game where um, Ste Stephen Curry, who, Steph Curry, who many of you, he went to Davidson. He took math, by the way. First time I knew of Steph was when he took Calc 1. We were in a department meeting, and they said, are there any Calc 1 students we should know about? Because most math majors don't come out of Calc 1. And they said, we do do, I'm not even sure you teach Calc 1 here, but, it, but we do at Davidson. And they said, there's this basketball player, Steph Curry. Oh, really? Should we encourage him to be a math major? I'm not sure he can pull off being a math major. I think it'll be a bit demanding. Well, we've had other basketball players. No, I mean, he's good. Well, we've had good basketball players. This is the one thing I remember. No, he's really good. And so <laughs> some things are predictive. Um, but when he got injured one year, you could downweight those individual games. You could just say, I'm going to make it worth a fourth of a game. Uh, it's a bit dangerous because if you only do it for select teams, then you're kind of goofing everything up. But I don't know. Maybe you could just do it for a few games. But I tend to be very dogmatic that if I'm going to do it for some, I want to do it for all. But, but a lot of my students don't agree with that. So at some point, we need to try it for select ones we know about or big teams. But if, if you get a ranking and you know the key player, then I just say override it and just go with your gut because you know the ranking's wrong. One more, and then you can come up afterwards if you have more. One down here? Okay. I'll repeat. Sure. So the, question, the question is, after the first round, can you uh, rerun the results and get new ratings? The answer is yes. The problem is you can't, you can't create a bracket um, that runs. But there are bracket tournaments that do that. ESPN has that. The first time I looked at that was last year when I was being interviewed eight to uh, 12 times a day. And I was, um, my wife was working, so I was the principal care caregiver with my kids, which made for a very interesting three-week period. And they just knew if Daddy said, okay, I'm going to have a radio interview, so you guys will be out here, and whatever happens, don't yell, and you got to work it out. Okay? All right. All right. I'll be back. When the phone rings, don't answer. Okay. And then we just do the radio interview. But I was actually uh, taking care of my kids, um, and Time Magazine asked me to do that. And um, I just should have said no. And I went, OK, we've never looked at that. I ran the result, and then I didn't rerun it. And you should always rerun it in five different ways and see if it's saying the same thing. But I didn't have the time. And it came up UCLA. So it says, Mathemat Bracketologist at Davidson predicts UCLA. And then they lost. So. Um, but yes, you can. But that's a new research question for us. And as we've looked at it, um, but really relate to that. I'm sorry, one more thing. Just relate, because if you guys worked on this, this is a cool idea. When that failed, it failed. So whatever. I mean, it's predictive. You know what I mean? Whatever. But when it, when it failed, I sat there and I thought, well, first I checked it again and went, ah, I didn't think of that. Jeez.
But then I thought about it, and it occurred to me, our methods are really good in the first round. Like, if you're in a bracket tournament, if they'll let you pick, just say, I'm going to use this, and after the first round, the best one wins. Because there's often very good chance that you could have that. The method is okay in the second round, but it can really be temperamental in the third and, and fourth round. When that happened, I thought about it and I went, you know what? I don't think the same predictive things are happening. What makes a team win in the first round versus what makes you win in the third round isn't the same thing. That's exactly what we're seeing this year, is there is a combination. You should run this for the first round, pick new weights and new things for the second round, and we've found a method that over the years produces a higher average bracket score. But it's new, so we don't really know totally if that, you know, we'll see. But that, that's related to your question. So thank you tonight. I hope that you've seen how math contains some of the madness of March, and I wish you well. And if you find something and you are willing to share it, I will love, love to hear what it is. You can literally email me and just say, I'm at Harvey, you don't even have to tell me you're at Harvey Mudd, but just say, I was there, and this is what I found. If you ever question that I want to know, I always, always want to know what you tried, even if it didn't work, because that's how we learn together. Thank you for your time and your attention. And before you run off to get the special desserts that are out there in the lobby, I'd like to present Tim and Tanya a sweatshirt and T-shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.